Uh, he goes up to some pray at the meeting for, for a church and also um, he's on some balls and he doesn't have your pictures and so forth. But his, he was in the hospital. He and his uh, three times friends, one of us, and so on. But Today and thank you for coming out. Um, I'm Sharon Jennings. I'm uh, on the board of the Traverse Area Historical Society and the membership chairman. So that's why I'll sit at the desk in the back in case anybody like to take one of our membership forms. Our goal is to preserve and present the history of Traverse City, and um, we need all the help we can get. We'd love to have you as members. Uh, today we're here at. Uh, what better place than at uh, the library here in Traverse City, Cattle, and we're going to be having a program on the history of Traverse City's libraries. Our two presenters are going to be Ann Sweeney and Ann McGowan. Ann Sweeney has been a librarian at uh, NMC for 38 years. She's a member of our historical society and the historical society on our own mission, and Ann McGowan has always had a you know, deep history uh, in or deep interest in history. So these ladies had decided it was time to tell the story of the libraries here at Traverse City, and it's quite a story. So they became the co-coordinators of the committee to report the story of Traverse City libraries. And with their research and work, um, they got together with an author who couldn't be here today, sadly, her name is Heather Shoemaker. And they put together a book that I believe will be available at the end of their presentation called Beyond Books, Stories of Traverse Area Libraries, 1860 to 2020. And now I'll turn it over to our aunts. Thank you. Yams, I'm the one without the E. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this was actually the brainchild of Anne Magoon, just so you know. And this, she, she talked me into it two years ago, January, to get started. We started recruiting people. And we had we had Heather Shoemaker in mind all along for the for being the author, and that just we, we couldn't have done it. I mean, we we're so fortunate to, to have her. I hope you're listening, Heather, because we appreciate you. Um, it, it's been a wonderful project. I'm probably going to read most of this. I hope you don't mind. Um, Everyone's been so generous with your donations of time and money, and most of all, with the enthusiasm. Um, if you're anyone that, that every time somebody helped us with a project, we wrote it down, and you know, on page 217, if you get the book, there's a list of names, I think over 75 names on there, of people that were generous um, with their, uh, with, with helping us any way, any way we wanted. Um, in fact, let me um, go to the next page here. This is the, the main cast right there. Um, but it, it's a long time to work on a project. It's still not perfect. You know, we could have kept going another year, but that gets kind of silly. <laughs> I kept thinking, yeah, there's one more page in the index we need to get in there. <laughs> and so if we hope that you find the book that scholarly. Uh, it was well researched. We had a really good group. We had people from the historical society helping us and, and others that we that we sent it to. And yet because of Heather, it's gonna be it's it's just a it's really fun to read and it's one of those books that quite honestly you might even even though you're sleepy go on to the next chapter to see what happens in that <laughs> um, I think you'll find it enjoyable. So let's see. Let's just get started because we have a long, long thing, and I don't want to get real bored. Thank you all for coming out, and to the people at home that are watching us also. Um, we started with this sign. 
And I'm just going to read what I wrote about it. My heart, I like adopted this sign. I just, I just love it. It has such a good history. You may not know where it is. Does anybody in the audience know where it is now? That's not on the stand. <laughs> I'll tell you later on. Um, so do you notice it includes the the phrase reading room? This room was hung. This this uh, sign was hung over the entry to New Carnegie Building in 1905. Um, we speculated. We're not able to prove it, but that the sign's first home possibly was above the door of the, of the city library when it rented space from the Ladies' Library Association. Um, they were there from 1901 until the Carnegie opened in 1905. And of course, that was the same place where Susan B. Anthony spoke. There was a huge library hall up there. Um, and they had a nice, a nice reading room. And by then, they'd accumulated over 2,000 books. Um, and they had they just shuffled along. Uh, the first, the first library was in the office of a Dr. Goodall, and he was a doctor that came and he did many things, and among them, he uh, then since after that, then the township books are housed in various places, including drugstores, offices of the township clerks, and even upstairs in the Hamilton Milton building. So it was a big deal when the city library made it to a large enough place to house the books, such as the Ladies' Library Association. Um, and I think that this reading room phrase is the first part of why we wrote the, the title of the book called Beyond Books. Um, you may wonder why this is here first prior to Carnegie. Uh, I'm going to talk later about this a little bit about the big site fight between Terry Hannah and Henry Hall regarding the location, basically with the west side versus the east side of Boardman. Um, but as soon as the Carnegie Library was built on 6th Street, there was a clamor to have a branch library on the east side of town. So in 1905 the collection was moved to the Oak Park School Building on the corner of Rose and Webster. This is a photo from the um, Traverse City yearbook. Traverse City High School yearbook. Um, it was called the Oak Park Library. It was used by the school children in the neighborhood community. However, uh, fortunately or unfortunately for, for them, the health department condemned the space in 1917. And uh, it moved to the little used fifth ward, which is there. Fifth Ward Hall. Um, uh, that was on the corner of Rose and Washington. Um, they, um, oh, I'll tell you. The city tore down the hall in 1928. You can tell us. It's a real good shape right there. And built um, this. Oh, and then they built this. Oops. Which one are you doing? Mm -hmm. I know, what do I do about that? Click it. It's a better idea. Well, that makes us go to the next room. Anyway, the fifth, the city agreed to build the fifth ward hall. I'm better if I just don't even try to read it. But only because that's where the, the citizens voted. They could be used as a library, but they, they built it only if they could use the lower level for voting when the time came for elections and people <coughs> of the fifth ward. So I'll see if this building looks familiar to you. Oak Park Branch Library, Corner of Washington and Rose Street. That's had a, it's had had a lot of um, a lot of people in there over over the years, um, including the women's the women's club, the Unitarian Fellowship was there. Um, it's now a private residence. A beautiful uh, red brick building. So back to the site fight. Uh,
this is a new map that was kind of reconfigured so we could show it, but I use my big arrow key here. So this is where the current Sixth Street Library is now on Sixth Street. This is where Perry Hanna wanted to build. He donated the land. The fight went on for nearly two years. And it wasn't just because um, it was kind of the war of the billionaires, except millionaires then. It wasn't necessarily just that, but um, most of the population was, was living over here on the east side of Boardman at the time. It was pretty much farm country out, out here. And so they, a lot of people wanted to be more of the central, central town. These little gold circles are, are where other important businesses were then. So um, where, where B is, that was the alternate site that Henry Hall wanted. I did it again. Sorry. This is the escape button. Okay. All right. I didn't mean to. Let's go back. Let's go back. There we go. Okay. This was where the current Central Methodist um, Church is now. It was an ideal spot. It was right on the water. Um, in fact, the ladies' library built right next door to them. A few years, a few years later, they loved that site. Um, and so that was so that was the that was what the fight was all about. Who was going to win? And Perry Hanna ended up being the winner. And so finally, in 1905, they um, it was 1902 that uh, that they got the grant from Carnegie. So that whole time was spent mostly fighting about where the location was going to be because Carnegie only um, agreed to pay for the cost of the building. The city had to fund the location and then tell, be able to maintain it after it was donated. So, oops. This is so easy at home to do. Okay. So, there's the Carnegie Library under construction. We discovered this picture. It's not a real well known one. And look how proud all those workers are. They're just strutting along on the top of the roof. And um, these people, these guys, way up here on this big pile of dirt. The reason I brought this up is. The, the next librarian, um, Helen Stout was the librarian at the time. Her assistant librarian was Alice Wade. And Alice was working here. She got to see the construction of the Carnegie. She stayed there till 1949. So that was like a second home for her. And uh, here's how it, how it looked. This was a few years after it was built. See the fence up there? It's, it's still a, quite an early picture. So this is what they moved into, and just think of the mansion they must have thought it was when they moved in in 1905. All this, all the space in the world. So here's Alice Wade, um, and the, that's a, she graduated from Trevor City High School. There she, that's a graduation picture. This first, this first one is obvious, and then in the middle, she was kind of more of, of the young lady, probably late twenties, I guess, but. Beautiful woman, and the interesting thing about her is, how many of you have heard of S. E. Waite? I think you have. Um, and he did the, he was the first schoolmaster out in Old Mission. He had the, the Madeline out there. She was his niece. And so um, he probably made sure she got a good education, paid attention, and read a lot. And she didn't have library credentials, but she did, she did go and do some study later on. And that's um, the, the picture, uh, well, it's obvious. She'd been there, this is probably about 48 or 49. There she is at the card catalog and she's still happy in her job. Um, <laughs> and then the remarkable thing is she, she um, after she retired in 1949, she remained as a volunteer for about another 10 years. And, uh, and this, is how it, this is how it looked when she retired. So you've seen the progression. She got to see it go from under construction to have an ivy grow all over the building. There was a, a librarian. So when she left in, in 49, there was a librarian, a man that was there just for a couple of years. And then um, Teresa Flaherty, who's the woman on the right, became the director. And, and she was a director until 1966, I think. Um, yeah, 1966. And, and the, the beauty of, of I, I said she was a woman of vision and she was responsible for many significant developments at the library while she was director. Um, the, the woman on the left is Teresa Schaub, who was assistant librarian and she also was the children's librarian and she, she worked there also for many years. 
um, the paper that they're holding in their hand is from December 4th of um, 1904. Yeah, December of 04. And um, can you see what they're looking at? They're looking at the design of the Carnegie's about to come into fruition finally. But it also proves to us that she cared about local history. And that made a big difference down the road when she was the director. So um, one of the main things she was responsible for this when they did the big renovation, this was the Cornwell edition, I think it was 1963, Niger had Amy, yes, 1963. Um, and you know, there's been a lot of talk about, about that, but it was, certainly was needed. We kind of like the cars, that's why we showed that particular <laughs> view. Um, but the, uh, the mayor at the time was Carter Strong. And people were saying, oh, it's, it's too modern, it doesn't fit. Or some people were saying that they loved it. And he was clearly a politician because he praised the new library building and he said, it's, it's a wonderful combination of the old and the new. <laughs> and that was. <laughs> Um, and then her next big vision, which has come full circle on here, we're getting another one, is the, the bookmobile that she brought. And there's a, there she is, she's a woman on the left with a hat on in the door, and next to her is Helen Langworthy. Um, the children obviously are like having their photo taken, and that was the time that girls still had to wear skirts in the wintertime for things. So they're, we're, we're past that, but um, she, it was important to her that there be books were going out into the, she was big on the regionalism and she thought it was time to include people and she knew this would be a way to get people served out in the aligned communities. Okay, so I talked about um, local history and how important it was to Teresa Flaherty. That's the New Michigan room, the, the holder of library history. Um, back in 1965, this Phyllis Babel is one of the librarians, and the, the, the caption in the paper that we saw says Phyllis Babel with historical paper, looking through historical papers. You can't see them because they're the same color as her skirt. But <laughs> there they are. And then the woman on the on the left is Evelyn Brown, known as, as Miss, Mrs. Brown. And I just met a man yesterday who. Um, he, he lived around the neighborhood and he used to, um, he would come here and get his books. And I said, oh, did you know Miss Waite? Because she was known by that name because of the respect people had for her. And that also that's how he talked to people those, in those days. But he said, no, but I remember. And I said, how about Mrs. Brown? He said, was she a little short woman? I said, yes, she was. And he remembered her. She was very friendly and helpful to everybody. And, and she, was, um, she was there. I believe 50 years, she started around the same time the Carnegie was built. And then again, she's another one of those that worked once she retired, back she came to help to help out. Okay, these are the, the three males that just kind of pass through and I tried to find something on each one of them. I, I don't maybe that's not a nice way. <laughs> I didn't see that they've done a lot during that. During that <laughs> so, um, I hope this relatives are going to hear your <laughs> So um, Carl Berg is the first one. He was the fellow that was there for, for two years. And, and his story was he'd been in World War II. He went back to, to college on the, on the GI Bill. And this was his first job out. And he ended up being a, a, an important librarian in other places. I think he went to Saginaw first and then someplace else in the Midwest. He just didn't, we just couldn't find much that he'd done in the library records. So, you know, he got, he got the library through two years, that's good. And then the next one, um, the Bernard Oppenier, uh, he came directly after um, Teresa Flaherty retired. He was there from 1949 to 51. By the way, if anybody wanted a handout, I don't know if you got it, oh, some people did. I thought it might be interesting to follow along with all the library directors and when they were here, because it gets kind of, kind of confusing. Um, but the interesting thing that happened while he was the director is a man returned the book, A Man Without a Country. Well, it was 50 years overdue. <laughs> $260 worth of fines. And he, um, 
he waved the fine and he got his got in the paper and he was it was a good guy and so it, that that worked out. But it's, it's so interesting how people hang on and hang on and then all of a sudden it's brought back. So the, the third one um, was there a little bit longer, 1970-79. Um, his name was Robert Scotty only, but everybody called him called him Scotty. Uh, he ended up having a different view on library fines entirely. He tried amnesty weeks and it just didn't work out. Um, the one year when he was there, like I think it was 1971, they, they cost him over $2,000 just to replace the books that people had not returned. And so, um, you know, that, that was a sizable uh, sum. So you probably know the name Pete Doran, Peter Doran, who was city attorney for many years. He worked out a deal with him to make overdue fines a, a criminal offense. Somebody down, <laughs> downstate has, has done that. And so they had a plan. They sent out three warning letters. And um, if nobody responded, or you know, they didn't come and pay for the book or return the book, they would do an arrest warrant. Well, they ran into trouble right away because they couldn't tell if the books were checked out by kids or adults or, or who was responsible for them. And it was just ended up being too much hassle and they got pretty bad press for it. So that, that didn't work. And then um, when the next librarian came, who was Mike McGuire, he had a whole different attitude about that. So it wasn't a criminal offense for very long. I mean, we'd all be in jail probably, right? <laughs> Some of the books we might still have at home. Um, Mike was famous for standing at, that's his stand up desk. He had a bad back, I think, right from the, the, the get go. And so many people remember coming in and he'd stand there talking to you. So you didn't want to sit down in his office either. So you ended up having standing conversation. And maybe it was a way to keep conversation short too. <laughs> so, so he he came and um, they, they came to Traverse City in 1975 and found a house. And then he was assistant director from 76 to 79. And then when um, Scotty only left, Mike replaced him as director in 1979, and then he was here, I think, I guess 30 years as, as director. Um, his wife, Nancy, was interviewed by Heather. Heather interviewed over 25 people for this book, by the way, so we have a lot of good quotes, and you can find out good inside information if you want to read the book. Um, and, and Nancy said, um, Mike became assistant director and then director, and he never looked back. And that's, that's true. And she also said he was somewhat of a workaholic. Um, so he forged ahead and he brought the city library into modern times. Here's a few things that he did. Um, this, is, you know, this is 42 years ago. It's the first computer, uh, Radio Shack TRX 80. And um, they said, so they had 4K of memory. Um, yeah, can you imagine? <laughs> And, but he was pretty proud of that. Um, although people said that if you wanted to use it, you'd have to ask Mike if he needed to do it for you. Or he was kind of possessive of that, I guess. But cute little thing. Um, these are this is 1983, and he had a really fine staff assembled. Um, these are all the department heads standing on the, the steps there at the Carnegie Library. Um, and um, from left to right, it's like the names are on the top. So Teresa Shaw was assistant librarian and children's librarian. Mary Franklin is head of circulation. Marie Culebert, Culebert was the reference, head of the reference department. We have heard a saying for uh, many of the photos and the historical information in this book. After she retired, she's another librarian that retired and did good work. We found um, eight loose leaf notebook, so this big, on the, sh on the shelf that she compiles starting with the very beginning of the Carnegie Library on up through um, like five years after she retired. And so it was really, really useful information and good for her for doing that. It was a, a little problematic because, you know, we were doing our research during the time of COVID. And so um, we it's not like we could actually go in the Michigan room and. Um, you know, and search around and there weren't a lot of people in there. So we, the librarians would bring out a truck with things they thought we needed. <laughs> and then we sit and research, and research there. Uh, so the next thing, Mike was known as being a musician. And this is something I found out is he, uh, 
was part of the group, the Young Americans, you ever heard of those? Uh, touring group and right out of college. And so he was really big in this and he worked with um, Aaron here. Aaron was, was here at the time, um, starting the sight and sound department, I believe it was 1982. And um, then they designed a whole new logo. So you can see up on the left, is, those are laser discs. The first friends were bought them in their first car, bought them on laser player. And then um, over on the, the right are, are the, no, I'm right, I'm wrong. It's the, um, but yeah, the laser, the laser discs are on the right. 16 millimeter. Yes, yeah, 16 millimeter reels. And then I compare what those were. I thought those were like, they looked like um, scrolls. Those are books. <laughs> and so they did still have books and they were and they were proud of it. But they, they again, this is beyond books. They brought audiovisual to the, the, their, uh, their community. Um, okay, so now the Friends group, there'd been an early Friends group in the 1970s. But it was like a Grand Traverse Regional one, and included school libraries and the college. And um, Dorothy Hall was involved with that, if anybody remembers Dorothy. But this is the first time that there's a, a friends group for, at the time in 1982, it was still the Traverse City Public Library. And this is um, Jim and Ruth Hunter. And uh, they got together with some of their retired friends, the Pars and the Henricks. And they had an orientation meeting, January 1982. Okay, so they got the friends group going, and by summer, they had a book sale where they made $700. So that's pretty impressive. And listen, are you, if there's any friends out in the audience, they also held 300 programs that first year. Now, one thing they did, like weekly movies, so I mean, it's, but still, it's, it's impressive. And um, Jody Clark, was here today and um, and as it was a long time member of the friends group when it first started, uh, told us what it was like. She said the room would get packed. This was at those early meetings. We had speakers talk about books. It was an attempt to bring people into the library and see it as a community place. So the friends really, really added to what the, the group was doing. Um, and then so right after the friends group, and this happened in really quick succession, there was the district library experiment. <laughs> and so this, so remember the friends started in January of 82. In March of 82, the city and county passed a resolution to create a regional library as a one-year experiment. The city, the city chipped in 200,000 and the county gave, gave up, gave up 75,000. They working together to fund it. Um, and there's also um, some state aid. But the, the, the whole caveat was by the next year it had to be funded by the taxpayers to the tune of six tenths of a mill if it's going to work. They called the new entity the Traverse Area District Library or Cattle. So, and that, that name formally began in January of 83. Next came the hard part, which is convincing voters. The first vote failed in September. It was going to be one more vote in November 83. And if that didn't pass, it was going to be back to the drawing boards of what they were going to, how they were going to do it. Um, and guess what? This has a happy ending, as you know. The district millage passed by only 298 votes, though, and that was because of the, the people in the city that were in it, you know, pretty much for it, almost unanimously. And I see, I see former um, librarians and present librarians involved with the, the outline libraries. They weren't real happy with how it turned out, but it's a, it's a happy ending. <laughs> and so that's good. Um, but with that close a vote, the, the record eagle, that first page says, um, it wasn't a mandate. <laughs> and Mike said it was a squeaker. <laughs> but, but it passed, and that's, that's the start of uh, how we got going. Um, I just, I, this is, this is called Tattletales. Do you remember that, this, anybody? This was um, a long time newsletter. Again, this is a Jody Clark contribution. She was the, the editor of it. Um, and it, it was, it was fun to, to read. And it was where we got all the news. 
Um, the first one is just sort of a standard one from 1994. And it says, Traverse Area District Library, they're so proud to be able to say that. And then when they moved, uh, the blue one is Tattletales from February 2000. And look, at you can see now we, we have the clock tower and they're in the new building. Um, again, Beyond Books, it says Tattle offers many roads to reading. And there's those the two cards that were pretty probably new at the time. Um, so I'm almost finished with my part. I had to throw in some story time, time photos. Oh. Story time was important all the way back in 1917. It was the first report that we found in a newspaper. And the, the story time at the, at the library, a main library over a six month period, brought in 2,590 kids. But then, not to be outdone, the, the East Side Branch Library in the six month same time attracted 3,682. <laughs> I remember they were in a school. So that's, that's part of it. Um, and so Martha Vreeland, I'm sure you all know her. This is the cutest, first youngest picture I saw her. This is in the late 70s. She did a puppet show at the time. But she's uh, reading a book to him, it's called Little Bear. And then of course, everybody knows Gilbert and Brown Sugar. People always ask about, ask about her. I think I'm finishing my part because now the Carnegie is getting really crowded. Getting political, people are trying to figure out if they want to build a new building. And somebody's supposed to interrupt me at this time and take over. <laughs> <laughs> and here she is. <laughs> Great. Okay. So, so I take over right at the trough, right at the, the old Carnegie. It's already um, by 1990, it's already been around since um, 1905. So here we are, 85 years old. The area has grown. There's no parking hasn't grown, and it's a difficult time. Um, staff is getting kind of tired of working under these conditions. No air conditioning and uh, no handicap accessibility. So if anyone wants fiction, the librarian has to run upstairs. These these steep uh, metal stairs to get the fiction for uh, somebody who can't handle stairs. So it's really a tough time. And Michigan economy is in very good shape and nobody wants to vote for the proposals that the library trustees have put out. So why do I have to start here? <laughs> um, because long about 1994, the League of Women Voters Library Study Committee, which had been meeting for years and years and looking over how difficult it was to get any action on the library situation, changed their name from the Library Study Committee. They decided to be the Library Action Committee. And um, at that point, they started acting like they were going to do something. And so Within about a year, the Library um, Action Committee had put together a blueprint of how they could turn the sentiments of the area around and get the citizens on board to, to develop a new library. So they were goaded by the likes of Ken and Betty Parker. I don't know if any of you know these people. I love it when you nod your heads and say, yeah, 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 remember these people. Um, newspaper publisher, the Record Eagle publisher was Frank Sanger, and he was on board with this. And Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, David Hacker, um, also joined the efforts. So the League um, Action, Library Action Committee formed, uh, helped form Citizens for Libraries, whose mission was to build community support for a new library, a stronger library system, and to figure out what to do with the beloved Carnegie building. Um, 
with, okay, Citizens for Libraries. Does anybody not remember? I don't know who's new to the area. We kind of, when we prepare this, we don't know whether we're talking to people who are reflecting on things they know. Is there anybody who doesn't know about Citizens for Libraries? Okay, we have, have a couple, but I'll tell you a little bit about it. But that was the citizen um, education arm. It was a 501c3, so they could take money but it could not be an advocate uh, for a political vote. So there was Citizens for Libraries and its sister organization, Vote Yes for Libraries. And they worked together to convince voters to tax themselves for a stunning new library building on Boardman Lake. And to this day, to me, it is the new library building. <laughs> so leading this, this effort was the quiet, methodical, meticulous Judy Halstead of the League of Women Voters and the outgoing former college president, Dick Rosser. And the two of them pooled their skills and energies to oversee this growing team of volunteers. They're citizens for libraries. You can see our child logo, looking forward, reading book. And here are Judy and and Dick, and this is on the dedication day, the formal dedication of this library was in April, 1999. And I think they both look like they're thrilled that it's <laughs> over. Um, here's some of the advertising that was put out in the Record Eagle and on flyers and posters and at meetings all over the county. Um, a kind of crazy little fellow here, David Hacker was determined that there would be a mascot for this, this program. Uh, books and more is who he, he settled on. And books and more was uh, supposed to look like a book with a head and feet. I don't get it, but um, <laughs> it worked, right? Okay. So um, I mentioned Ken and Betty Parker, they were both lead members. Um, by this time retired from their professions and dedicated and and they could get me to do just about anything and many other people too so um, Ken went around and drummed up money for the new library and was very proud that he was the first donor and he knew how to make a splash he was a newspaper man and uh, started his career selling ads and so he was quite the salesman but right in the center there is is Ken Parker, his wife, Betty. Oh gosh, I did that too. Um, Betty, uh, Judy Halstead, Dick Rosser, Don Pratt, and um, Shirley Murray's up here, I see Shirley. Is there anybody else who's in the picture who's in this room today? Um, lots, of, lots of great people. So I thought you'd like to see that. But funding a library and getting people to vote for it wasn't easy in the 1990s. We were learning about things like the internet just coming on board and ebooks. And everybody was talking about this new thing called a search engine and browsers. Um, Yahoo, Amazon, eBay were all becoming part of our vocabulary. Um, and we were told that libraries were going to go the way of the dinosaurs. We didn't need books anymore, and paper was going to be one of those 20th century things. But nevertheless, Mike McGuire was hopeful. And here's what he said in a memo to his staff in September of 1995, shortly after Citizens for Libraries had pulled itself together to start this process. Hey there, hi there, ho there. There sure is a lot going on. The Citizens for Libraries, a group of energetic and dedicated citizens, is bound and determined to build a new main library for the community. Can't argue with that. This group needs and deserves our support and assistance. Our response to any request is yes, we can do that. So that was great to have Mike really on board and trusting that this group of ragtag citizens um, might make something of it. Um, staff, however, were pretty discouraged and skeptical still. Many of them had not been to a modern library if they had grown up in Traverse City. They hadn't gone away to school or gone to libraries elsewhere. They thought that this was what a library looked like and this was what, what you get and where you work. But um, and they were working under kind of difficult conditions, as I mentioned. Um, by now, 1995, there's a leaky roof 
and uh, everything's quite outdated. Voters have repeatedly rejected library proposals. One librarian's doctor told her that she should quit her job because the dust in the library was so bad it was making her allergies unbearable and she needed to find something else to do. But recognizing what was going on at the Sixth Street Library, the League of Women Voters pulled uh, another trick out of its hat and proposed a what we call in the League of Women Voters a go-see trip, where you're studying a problem and you want to learn more about it, whether it's um, how the sewage works in town or how the road commission makes decisions or whatever, go and find out. Don't, don't sit and talk about it. So we proposed a trip for um, library staff to go visit modern libraries, let them see what was possible. And uh, with Don Pratt of, of the board, and there were 12 staff uh, of the Tattle board. There were 12 staffers and several league members and uh, Tattle board members who went downstate. Jody, were you on that train? Okay, that's great. And visited five libraries and they were wow libraries. They were top of the line. They weren't Detroit, the Grand Rapids, they were smaller cities. And um, a two day trip, five libraries. And uh, as, as uh, Martha Breland, one of our assistant librarians at the time said, no one even had their carpet taped together. <laughs> no, imagine. Instead, they had art. The buildings were so beautiful, big, clean, fancy. Catherine Carrier remembered advice from fellow librarians they met. Don't let the architects sell you an architectural feature, they warned. We still ended up with a hole in the floor, she said. And, and you have to be upstairs to think of it as a hole in the floor. Of course, it's a hole in the ceiling if you're downstairs. The architect, however, assured us that the hole could be covered up whenever that was necessary. So these 12 staff members came back. Um, meanwhile, Mike did not go. Certainly Mike had been to other libraries uh, through his professional career. He stayed here and ran the library with a skeleton staff. Um, and the assistance of a volunteer crew, and I think that includes Shirley Murray, who's right here, who helped out in the library volunteering while the others were gone. Um, and, you. Hmm? and you. Uh, yes, and I was there too. <laughs> <laughs> so through the first half of 1996, oh, oh, and I also saw to say, the staff came back from that 48 hour trip. They were gone home. They were ready to go. Everybody was on board. They said, not only, yes, that's what we want. What can we do to make it happen? But they came back with a sense that they were doing a fantastic job with the limited resources they had here. They were running programs that were as good as any of the ones downstate on whatever scale they could. So it was just a real morale boost. And then that wonderful attitude spread. The librarian who had the allergies did not quit. <laughs> so now through the first half of 1996, boosted by this energetic staff, everybody's working toward a September village election and methodically going through and trying to educate voters and all. And that's until, and, and back in those days, you could have a September election. Um, but the clerks, the local clerks, all thought that was a horrible idea. There was already an August election on the, on the calendar. There was gonna be a big presidential election in November. They did not want to have a September election. So suddenly everything had to get moved up a month and um, quickly get into action to, to uh, not get into action, but speed up uh, the action so that there could be an August election. So Karen Nielsen, who was um, a parent in the TCAP system, fresh off successes running successful TCAP get out the vote campaigns. She really knew what she was doing and she came on board to help with uh, the effort with Citizens for Libraries and Vote Yes for Libraries. She knew how many no votes to expect. She knew that, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but let's say there you expect a, about 10 or 12,000 voters in an election. 
and that 5,000 of them were going to say no because they were no voters, that they didn't want taxes. They thought everything was okay the way it was. So she knew that you had to have 5,001 votes, but of course you really had to have maybe seven or 8,000 votes on your side to just cover the bases. And she was wonderful. Her leadership and her confidence just instilled more confidence in other people, more energy. And we all know the result of the, the vote August 6th. And after years of rejection at the polls, Tattle got the go ahead to have a wonderful new library for the 21st century. So um, I think you all know about this library, but I'm just going to go through quickly and tell you a little bit about the history of this site and um, move forward. And then we have a little video at the end that I want to share with you. So this is the site of of the Tattle Library where we are now. And it's not exactly the same footprint, but it's kind of similar. <laughs> Over to the right is Gordon and Lake, and um, there's a railroad track. There's still one today. So this is the northeast end of, of Boardman. This is what it looked like in 1994. Um, right in the center here is, is where, where we are. And at that time, this was the um, still is the sewage treatment plant, and now there is a um, the sailing club at school are right here, but that didn't exist there. So this is kind of an abandoned, um, rundown area of town. Woodmere Avenue is kind of um, underappreciated, shall we say, at that time. And the site selection committee, um, Fred Nelson, Don Pratt, Ted Kidd, Brian Crow, all worked quietly before they announced what their, their choice was. There were lots of possibilities, but, but um, the site selection was done before the August 6th vote so that people knew what they were voting for. And, and in some ways that's risky, but it's just the kind of thing Traverse City does. We're, or did at that time anyway, <laughs> tells, tells you what it is that you're gonna get. You're not getting a pig in a coat. And, and so here we are today. You can see the railroad track is still there and we have this great library and you'll notice perhaps that it has parking. And <laughs> that was pretty important. Um, when when uh, there was surveys, page, patron surveys of what people wanted in a new library and um, Tattle had 60 pages of comments from 1,500 patrons. And I don't want to tell you how many of those had this, their number one request, better parking. Um, but in, in this parking lot, we could take about 148 cars if everybody parks correctly at, <laughs> at the, the Sixth Street Library, maybe 13. <laughs> okay, so there you go. Um, Bob Holdeman, a local architect, drew plans for the building, and this was also in the paper before the vote. Plans for a building that would fit the site. You can see that it was topped with a clock tower echoing the roof line of the nearby train station. And as Director McGuire later described the building, it was like having two football fields, one on top of the other. It's that long. Um, we calculated, and that's just about right. And the 50-yard um, line would be right about where the reference desk is on the second floor. So kind of a big building, again, compared to the, the Carnegie. Um, oh, I added a slide here, too. OK, so, <laughs> so here, here uh, I like this comparison. On the left is the Talon Library, which none of you saw um, because the trees have grown up so much that you wouldn't be able to see the back of the bump side of, of the old um, Carnegie Library. Um, but that's what it looked like back in the early 1900s. And then, of course, on the right, maybe none of you have been down to see what it looks like from the water side as well. But I love that comparison. We have the bump and a railroad track, not every library can recreate a railroad track um, <laughs> when it moves. And then of course, a water feature, the, the Boardman River on the old library and then the uh, Boardman Lake that we have here. Another view, this is the view of the bump 
from the inside and the grand staircase. Um, this is looking from, of course, from the second floor looking out and I don't know if you can see the mobile very well there. Can you see that hanging? Does that show up? I like that, that feature. So when the design team decided on topping the structure with a clock tower, it made sense to include the clock face as part of the Traverse City, um, the Traverse Area District Library logo. It was distinctive and attractive, but they debated about what time should be on, on the logo or should the hands be. Karen Nielsen remembered that the eventual decision was to leave the hands off entirely after this long debate. But I think it's very appropriate because if you're reading a good book, don't you get lost and lose <laughs> track of the time? Sometimes not really important. Okay. Um, back to that hole in the floor. <laughs> it's value. Has everybody been up to the second floor? You know what we're talking about? Okay. Its value has been debated since the beginning. It's giving up precious space right in the middle of the library. Um, but it was one of those architectural features that they were warned about. Uh, <laughs> um, so in addition to uh, Mike McGuire's planning, he had no business manager until I think about 1996 or 97. He did uh, most of the financial work and administrative work. He had two associate librarians, but he was the one who really was the architect of the financials for the library. And not only did he plan for, for this building, but also for additional funds to make the Tattle District work better. And after many years of kind of difficult relations, after Tattle started off maybe on the wrong foot because some of the member libraries thought everything was just fine the way it was, thank you very much. We don't need to be part of Tattle. Things got so much better, and eventually we had a, a really good, and I think, I think, I hope that all of the outlying libraries, the branches and members would agree that this works very well for everybody. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and these are the libraries as they exist today. All of them have been built since um, 1999 when this library opened. And so I guess libraries aren't going to go away. In the future. Now, I don't know if you know this guy. Um, anybody remember him? He came on staff in 1997, and he's responsible in large part for much of the advanced technology in this room. So let me talk to you, and in later years, let me talk to the people out of the as well. Thank you, everybody. So uh, he must be a historian, whether he knew it at the time or not, but he put together a great video that was a slice of history. And uh, I want to share excerpts from this video. It shows the, I want to make sure I tell you because it goes very fast the way we've done the excerpts. Um, he starts with um, the groundbreaking ceremony for this building and Mike is going to talk a little bit and then and Jody Clark is in that she's wearing a yellow uh, jacket at the groundbreaking um, it, and then it goes to the last day at the sixth street library that was December 19th 1998 and complete with bagpipers and then goes on to showing the raising of the clock tower the pre-opening gala for donors on January 9th, 1999. And at that point, we had um, estimates are from 1,200 to nearly 2,000 people in this building. So don't tell the fire marshal. And, um, and then the ribbon cutting, Fred Nelson, thank you for cutting the ribbon. And at the official dedication, that was not done on the first day, that was done in April in official dedication. And, um, and then it ends with opening to the public. So we can show the video. Uh, it goes quickly. I do want to preview Mike's words so that you'll hear them twice. You'll hear me say them first and then Mike at the groundbreaking ceremony. He underscores the role of public libraries, noting 
and reassuring uh, words, the continuity aspect, as well as the fact that it was undergoing change. He says, it's going to serve the community well. We're not here today to celebrate the start of something, but the continuing efforts of the library to serve the community. And all of the librarians I've ever known are here to serve the community. They do a great job. Here, this way. Just, just to try to keep you a little informed on what's going to happen, by the end of the month, we'll have our bids in, and hopefully we'll start real construction uh, in June or perhaps July. And we're looking at about a year and a half of a construction project, and when that's done, you're now standing overlooking the lake inside the building. Back there was a little square bunch of balloons. That's the entryway. The balloons actually outline the building. It's big. It's going to serve this community well. And we're not here today to celebrate the start of something, but the continuing efforts of the library to serve the community.
still sitting here holding your breath because I never told you where the reading room sign was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's upstairs over the Michigan room where Nelson room. So go up and take a look at it sometimes. It's about 125 years old. So the story with the sign too is I started here 20 something, 22 years ago. And when I moved to reference after five years, there was hardly any artwork on the walls and upstairs in the third floor was that beautiful sign as well as all this artwork that we now put in the um, or, or old photos um, that were huge. Someone blew them way up and they're so beautiful. And so I hated them being on the third floor. So I just took the initiative and took them all out and said, and, and the reading room sign was about that one. It's one of my favorite signs too. It's, it, it reminds me of the Sixth Street Library so much. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. And and Aaron just reminded me it's in the book, but that the, the uh, artist for the mobile that you saw being um, installed with this will case, and that's still there today, right? The, the mobile issue. The dust thing. Uh, and if you, Aaron just brought into a sign um, <laughs> in color. <laughs> so, I guess there is a sense of history here. We don't throw things away. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, are there other questions? Comments? Do you want to buy books? <laughs> and there was actually a question that came online. And uh, could you just speak about the discount program you have for the friends of the library? Oh, sure. Right. Um, the, this book was totally funded by the community. So all proceeds go to the Traverse Area District Library local history collection. So when you buy your book, which retails for $25.95, um, all of that goes, goes to, if, if you buy it from Cattle, that should go to the local history collection. You can also buy it from bookstores. The Friends of Tattle made a very generous grant to this project. And part of the deal was that by giving the grant to us, friends get a 20% discount. Um, if they buy it through Tavern. So if you're a member of the Friends and your name is on the membership list, you, you should get the 20% off. It's Thank you. It's also available for ice cream. Yes, and, and it's uh, currently, well, not currently because books haven't arrived until <laughs> They won't arrive until tomorrow. But we do have, we, we have yours yeah. here today, but the, the big shipment um, doesn't arrive until tomorrow, but we went down to Ann Arbor and got it. <laughs> uh, and then Horizon and maybe some bookstores in Leland County as well. Just a uh, comment. Thank you, Anne. And Anne, this yeah, is awesome sure. to document this history of our libraries. And I can't thank you enough. I think the only member of Crystal who is here in person today, I hope the others are watching um, on Zoom, but Jody Clark has been with us from the beginning as a member of the committee to record the story of Traverse Area Libraries. And we have that name because I couldn't remember anything else. It has to have sort of an acronym to it, even though there's no Y in it. But Jody is here today and she was a big part of her friends, as Ann said earlier, and has been a part of our, our committee too. So thank you. Hello. Also, I forgot to put it on that second screen of acknowledgments, but Peg Johnkoff was also one of our major donors to the project. Thank you, Peg. Yeah. 
Thank you, ladies. That was a great program. We all learned a lot, a lot of memories. And thank you for all the work, hard work you did on the book. Can't wait to read it. And uh, thank you all for coming. We appreciate your support. Can I get a quick ad? Sure. We have another great book on local history. This is Marty McCall, and she's going to tell you about her book. So if you haven't had a chance to look through it or um, buy it even, uh, this is the latest local Traverse City local history book that um, came out very, very end of December. And I brought a few copies with me if anyone is interested. Um, the net growth seeds from this also go to the Travers uh, local history plot here at the library. So um, please take a look. And if you're interested in a copy, I will make myself available. <laughs> so thank you. <clears throat> and I've read Marty's book, and it's great. It's all, of, all about the old town neighborhood and the amount of research she did. It goes by by the way, too. So we have two great books for our history lovers. And um, again, thank you for coming. And there's some refreshments, some homemade cookies and lemonade over on the table. So uh, we'll go over and have a little snack before you leave. But thank you again. <laughs>